He's getting ready. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Good evening and welcome to the 8th December 2014 Town of Hampton Board of Selectmen's meeting. One is public comment period. Mr. Moody. Art Moody, 3 Thompson Road. <clears throat> uh, what am I going to speak on? <laughs> oh. Trust funds. Uh, one of the, the second minutes you're going <clears> to <throat> do from two weeks ago, your, your Warren article meeting. Uh, Attorney uh, Gerald is quoted as saying that the board had tasked him to look into the trust fund matter. Well, that was done in private, apparently, because it, it was never a public decision of the board to have him do that. But uh, there's no report yet, I understand, uh, from him. And hopefully that will be public, even though maybe the uh, professional courtesy that he may display for one of the trustees of trust funds, who happens to be a fellow attorney, I uh, hope that won't interfere with his <coughs> report. Uh, I mentioned the fact that twice should be recovering the ill-begotten gains of Mackinson and Company and whatever fees, other fees, that we don't know about. Maybe that uh, outfit in Kansas custodial care fee. Uh, Mackinson owns a piece of that uh, outfit. Uh, there's another way the each trustee is uh, in the town's blanket bonding, surety bond for the faithful performance of their duties. And if they signed MS 9 and 10 reports to the state departments, they were false. Did not include all the income from all the trust funds as required, then you may be required you may be able to recover something from the bonds that you pay for every year, the town pays for every year. Another item on your, uh, in that minutes of the 24th of November is the uh, vote to uh, abolish the Heritage Commission. And the planning board has posted its first hearings on f zoning amendments <coughs> and the abolishment of the Heritage Commission is not listed for the 17th, the third, at least the third uh, Wednesday in December. Uh, the, uh, the law that you used to not have a petition of 100 voters was to, uh, another law, 131, colon 31, that the selectmen could put an article in, even though the state law says petition, uh, which is a pretty stupid thing for the state legislature to do. <laughs> Why didn't they put it in the original article? Uh, RSA 673.18 reads that, well, that's not, that's, that's the process you're supposed to follow. The uh, article uh, saying, how do, you, how do you abolish planning boards, heritage commissions, etc.? It's a petition of 100 voters. It also gives the wording of the article. <coughs> Are you in favor of abolishing the heritage commission uh, upon petition of 100 voters of this town? Now, the Senate Bill 2 law on official balloting says that the the limiter of session can't change a question that's prescribed by law, but it doesn't say anything about the selectmen doing it in advance of the limiter of session. 
uh, <coughs> that article on abolishing also says that it shall be processed to the planning board under that 873-4, which means a public hearing by the planning <coughs> board. And a caveat on the ballot, whether they approve or disapprove of the article. So they have to have 10 days after publication of a legal notice or a public hearing. So I, I, I don't think that law, 13131, gives the selectmen the right to cancel everything in that article. They can cancel the petition, but they, I don't think they can cancel the public hearing by the planning board. Mm -hmm. So I'm just forewarning you that you may have to do that, <coughs> otherwise the whole process is tainted. Any further public comment this evening? <coughs> Seeing none. Roman two announcements and community calendar. Mary Louise. Um, a, a wonderful Christmas parade again on Saturday. It was a shame that the weather was not um, nice enough to draw the crowds that we have in, in an unusual Christmas uh, parade. But uh, certainly the effort was marvelous. The floats were incredible. People did such hard work. Uh, that was a nice, nice community effort. Thank you, ma'am. Sir. Nothing. Thank you, sir. Uh, to go along with Mary Louise's theme, the uh, the Christmas parade was indeed a, a great time. Also, the tree lighting on the uh, the night before at, at Morelli Square. Uh, there were a number of people there. A number of restaurants came out and, and had refreshments, and the horse rides with the uh, wagon rides were there, and um, there had to have been five six hundred people there during the the height of it when they turned all the lights on, and it, it was just another good. Good old-fashioned town event, and I want to congratulate everybody that put it on, the rec department and everybody, and uh, for the people that came out and showed up. Thank you, sir. Same thing. Mary Louise and Rusty said the uh, tree lighting was great. It was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people there. Um, good community event. Uh, Recreation department did a great job doing that, and Experience Hampton did a great job with the um, uh, Christmas parade. It was cold, as you know, yeah. but it was fun walking, and there was a good crowd, and people interacted, and it was, it was great. It was a fun, fun event. It was just good to see all our departments there. I mean, every, yes. one, of, every yeah. one of them was well represented from the town office to the rec department to the police, fire, public works. Everybody was there, and uh, it was really a town town event, and it was very nice. And then I just want to just say that, you know, winter's coming. <laughs> weather's getting bad. People should watch their driving. And also ponds and stuff that the ice is not safe and that people should make sure ice is safe before they go on it and be careful of those things. Thank you, sir. Mr. Welch, any announcements for community oh. calendar? No, sir. Thank you. Roman 3, approval of minutes, 1, November 3, 2014. A motion? Uh, I'll so move, but do we, I need to read the stipulation that we have from council. Thank you. Please do so. And I want to make sure that I did it right. Oh. <coughs> Bless you. I had it right in my hand. Here it is. Okay. I assume this, Fred? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, the wording uh, on page one of our 12-1 memo uh, for November 3rd, 2014 minutes, I move to vacate the action taken by the board at its November 3rd, 2014 meeting in Part 6 as to amending and correcting the wording of the October 20, 2014 minutes, but to retain the draft wording of the November 3rd, 2014 minutes <coughs> and to add the following supplement to Part Roman 6 of those minutes. Quote, supplement. At its meeting on November 17, 2014, the board held off on implementing the above correction and amendment to the minutes of October 20, 2014, and instead sought the input of legal counsel. On the advice of counsel, the board voted on December 1, 2014, to retain the wording of parts Roman 9 and Roman 10 on pages 7 and 8 of the minutes of the October 20, 2014 meeting as they appeared in their draft form, except to strike the following words after 8.02 p.m. and enter into a non-public meeting under RSA 91A colon 3 Roman 2 small a and c 
and under RSA 91A colon 2 Roman 1A and two, to add the following supplement at the end of the October 20, 2014 minutes on page eight. Supplement, recognizing that it had not made the requisite motion or taken a roll call vote, the board did not enter into a non-public session under RSA 91A colon three Roman two small a and c, and instead met with legal counsel in a non-meeting under RSA 91A colon two Roman one small b. And I assume that wording will be copied. A second? Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Roman 3, number 2, November 24, 2014, approval of minutes. I will move that approval, Mr. Chairman. Any modifications, corrections, discussion? A second. second. Second by Waddell. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Roman 4 is appointments. This evening, it's our understanding Senator Nancy Stiles is inbound uh, to discuss next terror. <laughs> we will jump to Roman 5, new business. Selectman Woolsey. Well, I, I, let's see. I think what I have to say is, is really under the draft warrant articles, and, and uh, I think that I would forego new business for the moment. I'm still not terribly comfortable having new business come before old business, but that's all right. Seeing no new business from Selectman Wolsey, Selectman Griffin? Nothing, thank Selectman you. Selectman Bryden? Mm -hmm. Selectman Waddell, nothing. Roman 6, old business, 1, draft warrant articles, alpha, update, Selectman Wolsey. Uh, I had a brief discussion with the manager before this meeting on the uh, community article that we need to submit to the voters for the fire. I need a secretary. For the um, flood, for the flood uh, article that we need on the warrant to try to comply with the requirements of the federal government to give us better rates on flood policies. Here it is, the community rating system. So I'm hoping that we get from the federal government or from Jennifer Gilbert in Concord or someone the appropriate wording. I would think that should not be something that we should have to draft in-house. There must be a boilerplate article uh, that we can submit to the voters. Okay. Is that fair? Very. Mr. Welch says it's very fair, Slipman, does it? Wow. All right. That made my whole evening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other new business? I, I, or, um, pardon me, old business. Yeah, I kind of look forward to having uh, counsel here um, because he was, you know, I have gotten rather excited over this aquifer protection district. And I would like to see... Um, the, reading the memo, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the memo except to refer to the uh, planning board wording in here, but this is uh, dated 11-23. And I have a serious question in my mind as to the responsibility. Where does the responsibility lie? These stipulations that have been set forth by the planning board there are requirements set forth, but I see no ability to enforce. And so I'd like to try to understand what we're doing. I did notice uh, it says under recommendation of the planning board, uh, an impact fee in the amount of $3,641 for each single family home is hereby assessed. I am assuming that's a school impact fee, yes. but I wouldn't swear to it. I mean, since that's the only impact fee they have put in in place. And then it, number 10 says a homeowners association shall be established and remain in existence. We're talking about five properties here, one which already exists fronting on Woodland Road and four other parcels. Um, I, I just don't, I don't, uh, for one thing, I don't want to accept this road as a public road. Just and, I, well, I think we need some guidance. And uh, The approval is subject to the Board of Selectmen's acceptance of the sewer easement that runs over Lot 5. There are too, too many stipulations in here. Mr. Lissara did say 
uh, at the planning board meeting because I did attend this meeting that well it's it's up to the selectmen to basically police the um, the development once it's completed I don't that's why I'm looking for parameters of enforcement here well if I can just interrupt for a second yes. please selectman Wilson is that we have a liaison to the planning board is that correct mm -hmm. and who is that uh, I'm the planning board representative okay so you're the planning board representative and, and just in terms of lines of communication in mm -hmm. terms of staffing to raise questions that the board would have I, I think it's appropriate perhaps the board agrees that the representative to that board would be entertained with your questions and then he would staff it through the town attorney and we would uh, seek fruition to answer your questions but I think that's that's the appropriate way rather than you know any individual member going to different board meetings uh, putting in their input that's the purpose of assigning liaison or board representation so I've heard what you had to say mr. Griffin the floor is yours <coughs> well um, I what are the what could there be about that um, road there that would make it not acceptable mr. Walsh to the uh, town if the road represented an unnecessary risk um, traveling the road under certain conditions uh, and the risk was the liability of the town the selectmen may decide that they would not accept the road for that reason because you would then be liable for whatever happened on the roadway it would be of an unusual nature and not normal well you know I uh, I know that mrs. Wellesley is concerned about the uh, 400 feet to the uh, aquifer mm -hmm. but that's the standard for the whole United States and um, I you know pretty much that's how the board feels about it there uh, I'm not really sure who would be in charge about if there's a problem about the salt who keeps track of that huh. if it's a public highway and I've seen the grade on that road from the uh, the construction drawings mm -hmm. if we have freezing rain or difficult situations which may make the road very slippery um, it would have to be sanded and salted Otherwise, the road would not be traversable. Uh, the municipality would be liable for damages uh, to whoever had an accident there if, if, in fact, we didn't maintain the road properly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's pretty much. <coughs> would you like me to bring these issues up? I have brought these issues up at the planning board, as you well know. Well, they've would... been brought up there all the time. Yes, but but, but I'm. If I, I do want to continue the conversation, if I may, in public, just so we have a feel for what's happening, because I'm not comfortable with just saying, well, we brought it up. I, you know, the, the attorney has a memo here. I, I know. If and, I can, if, and, and I'm happy, to, we're happy to do this, but um, it's, it's a, another board issue. Uh, it's, a, it's a planning board issue. I, I haven't read every single planning board hearing. Let me just finish for a second, please. Uh, I'm not stepping on their traffic. I don't know if it's been finally uh, approved. Um, that's not my responsibility. I'm not a planning board member. Mr. Griffin will bring that news, his concerns. I think that's the only rational, reasonable way to staff these issues. We want to hear what you have to say, but it doesn't necessarily have to be tonight. And I think it has to be more systemic. It has to be more procedural uh, to affect good outcome. And. Uh, that's that's what we really need to do here and we can't be looking over the shoulder of, of every single board that's in the middle of approval and in, in, in judgment on development or budget or, or whatever it is the floor is back to you ma'am <clears throat> this is a town issue the planning board isn't going to sit there being sued if we have problems here uh, this ends up by getting dumped in our laps like a lot of the developments like the Hutchinson Drive development that never should have been built there that I referred to last week there is no policing here once a neighborhood is built and even in many neighborhoods as it was being built I haven't seen much by way of um, uh, inspections and and checking out what's going on I can tell you that, and I've said it publicly and I'll say it again that once these developments are underway 
You're not going to have anybody telling anybody or telling on. You're not going to have a neighbor calling Fred up and saying, "Whoa, Mr. Jones is putting fertilizer on his lawn." There are all sorts of stipulations that are feel good for the public, but it doesn't mean anything. And I want to understand what we're doing, especially in this very sensitive zone. I would like to see us have an article drafted focused on the Aquifer Protection District, which as far as I'm concerned is baloney because there is no such thing. The Aquifer Protection District, you can see it on the map down on the planning board, the Aquifer Protection District isn't protecting anything. It's being built in, the salt on all the roads, right Fred? I mean, we are salting the roads in the Aquifer Protection <coughs> District. And in this particular instance, the proposed development slopes down, actually, into the parameter of the wells. I don't care about 400 feet. The water doesn't care about 400 feet. Mother Nature doesn't give a banana about 400 feet. And there is the potential for contamination in that area, and I think it's unacceptable. I gave Fred an article today out of the Portsmouth Herald, and I dropped copies off of the planning board about pollution up in uh, Portsmouth and uh, Pease, I think it is. We may all die and go, and nothing may happen, but 50 years, 100 years from now, there may be big problems in that area. I don't want to be responsible for that. I don't want to be doing something. I don't want a piece of paper that says you can't salt the roads and you can't use fertilizer and you've got to be nice. That development, that particular proposed development is a terrible risk. Terrible risk. The water companies, as long as I have been acquainted <clears throat> with them, have spent a lot of money and a lot of time finding other sources of wells. They don't just sit up there and pump water. They're constantly on the lookout for viable wells. That's one of the most viable, uh, best producing, uh, incredible wells that we have in this community. And I think that all this paper stuff is baloney. I think we need to, to talk with, with Mark, if possible. This is an issue I would like to put to the public. <clears throat> this is an appropriate issue, I think. Not asking if you want to hire three more police officers on a special money article. I would like an article drafted for beefed up protection in the aquifer protection zone. Make it a true aquifer protection zone. Okay, and let me just go to Mr. Griffin in just a second where, where we've morphed from this particular development specifically in discussion uh, in detailed reference by you. Now we're talking uh, warrant for a aqua for protection and that would be uh, incumbent upon you to, to draft that, make a motion, and whether the board approves it or not. So we can talk about it. Now we're going to go back to Mr. Griffin. Yeah, as a board member, I'd be, uh, as a, <coughs> uh, plan, uh, a select board of selectmen, I don't think that that's, our uh, that's something that we should do to make it more restrictive than any other place in the United States. Um, and we got those figures from the people Mrs. Wolseley brought to the meeting. Uh, the water company representatives, but I would like to say that you know you have to be careful about in that area because there's many other houses around there, and they're all fertilizing their yards. Uh, so, uh, why, why we would want to get into trying to keep track of all of this, I, I just can't imagine how it would ever really work out very well. People would be able to do what they want to do, uh, and they would do it whether they uh, were. You know, people would, once they buy their house, I think they think that they're in control of their own yards, especially when all their neighbors are doing the same thing to their yards. Uh, I don't think this is something we can police as a board of selectmen. Um, I think it's clearly stated by representatives from the water company that it's 400 feet everywhere, and including in Massachusetts, if the wells are uh, lower producers, they can lower it to 250 square feet. I don't think we need more restrictions. And basically, this is another board's. Uh, these people are all elected. They make the decisions. Uh, I can't see why we would take our town attorney to waste uh, to <coughs> take time to try to do something like this. I'm not in favor of it. Thank you. Selectman Bridal. To the, to the aquifer protection area we have now, I know we don't do any. Um, I mean, there isn't a, they sand. I know some other towns do reduce salt or reduce or sand only. 
Is that because of the aquifer protection zones? It's, be it's because of their individual ordinances. Okay. They, they do have areas that are extremely sensitive there. There are municipalities where wells are located quite close to the roadways. Mm -hmm. And and in those areas, I think you'll find that cities and towns do not salt, or they put minimal salt down so that they don't have an impact. That goes back to a, uh, a situation in the town of Weston, Massachusetts, where they put in a, uh, a new well, and the state came along and improved their state highway system. And uh, within a matter of a few years, the well was so contaminated with salt from the salting of the state highway that they had to abandon it. And, and there needs to be judicious use of salt. We don't go out there and put it on by the bucket load every square foot, but we do put enough on to keep the road free and traction ability on the roadway. And these wells that Mary Louise, are they, are they 400 feet from the road presently? No, no, no. Oh, the no. Road There's a 400 foot radius around the well. Right. And, but and, and, and our roads are, in, are not in that <coughs> no. radius. No. They're, they're at the back of the development in this particular case. They're behind all the lots. Uh, but the, the land, her, her comment is that the land slopes towards the wells, yep. so therefore she's <coughs> concerned about the runoff over a long Drainage. period of time, but po yep. potentially polluting them. Mm -hmm. They're 600 feet away. Yeah. Well, the water doesn't measure. Select so down. Yeah, I mean, I, I read the minutes. I, I didn't yeah. read specifically, you know, da, 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 and I read the reports and stuff, and, and I've got to agree with Rick that, that they're an elected board, um, that, that it's their responsibility, that the, the way the government's set up, the planning board has that responsibility. I think aquifers have to be uh, protected, but I think Aquarian came in and said that it wasn't that dangerous. Um, and I think we can go overboard with the protection. I think we have to protect it, but I, and I, I'm going to defer to the planning board, and I think there are a lot of people on there who have spent a lot of time studying this kind of thing. And that, that's where I'm going to go with it. Thank you. Uh, let me let me just say, <clears throat> I don't think there's going to be a motion passed by this board for a Warren article that that has anything to do with the aquifer. I agree with Mr. Griffin. I agree with Mr. Bridal's comments. I agree with Mr. Waddell, and I appreciate your concern, as I know the town does about the water supply. <coughs> so, having Ms. said that, no, I, Mr. Let, Chairman, let, I, just just let me finish, and I'm going to come right back to you. I, pr I promise you. So, in terms of all business in, in, in the research on that. I think the board is clear. Um, I think they've spoken eloquently and emphatically about their position. Now, finally, back to you for this issue for a wrap-up, please. Okay. The Aquarian, uh, which, uh, which is uh, included in here, by the way, all of the information from Aquarian, and they spent a, a good deal of time checking on that. My problem is not what the planning board can do. My problem is what we're stuck with after they do it, because they're not going to enforce it. They're not going to be hovering over every lot. Same as with everything in this town. Why? Here you have the uh, planning board. Date, November 19, 2014, updated. This is the planning board's memo right here. And why, why does it say in this memo after hearing Mr. Griffin's comments, a homeowner's uh, association shall be established. And then it's talking about number 27, the use of road salt and other de-icing products that may impact drinking water quality, nitrogen-containing fertilizers, and regular pesticides and herbicides shall be prohibited. This condition shall be noted on each of the recorded new deeds. Additionally, a street sign shall be provided at the beginning of the roadway that says no salt area. Baloney. Who the devil is going to enforce that? And it's not going to be the planning board. Okay, I'm gonna, <coughs> Why I'm, are they putting... Uh, I'm, uh, I, uh, no, no, we're, we're, gonna we're here. No, no, let me Phil. tell you. I'm the, I'm the chair. We have, we have talked about this. This is unscheduled. This is another board. The board has made itself clear. We can, we can if you would like bring it forward for another meeting. But and be shut off again? We're, we're not shutting anything off. We're yes, you are shutting me off, and it's an important issue. Just just as, just as a point of order, it, it wasn't, if it's so important, we need you to skip. You have just let, 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 Let's not interrupt here. each other. I've, I've, I have the floor. If it's so important, yes. then it needs to be a scheduled item on the agenda with representation, and we need to make motions, and if your motions aren't 
seconded or approved, then it dies at this board level. And that's just how that works in government in Hampton. Well, you have draft warrant articles generic. You, did, you have nothing specific there, and I am proposing that as a draft warrant article working with council to well, enhance the protections a in for, the aqua Is there a second for Selectman Wolsey to pursue a draft warrant article for an aqua protection? For additional protection is in there the aqua second, protection zone. Is there a second? Is there a consensus? Is there any support for that? And seeing none at this board, that is not going forward. Okay. I will make a point of bringing back that information of who do they intend to keep track of these issues. But my the feel is that they'll never really be kept completely being tracked of. Because you know, they don't. You can't rely. You, people are going to do what they want to do. It's we know like, that. So why are you putting needless provisions well, in here? I, That's crap. Believe okay. me, I didn't. Crap. Just, 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 just as, as a, a point of decorum and, and uh, um, Civility. Um, we're going we're to move forward. We're going to um, backtrack here for just. Are we, we going to come back to Warren Articles, or are we going to move on? Well, yes. Yeah, so like the, okay. yeah, yeah. The, the state senator is here, so we're going to mm -hmm. accommodate her from a road trip. Um, and Nancy, take your time. Come on up. Thank you for your trip. I just want to know if she got a ticket on the way. <laughs> I didn't. The police were busy with someone else. <laughs> Good Sen evening, Nancy. Senator Stiles, thanks for coming down tonight. And we know how busy you are and, and how uh, important you are to this district and how important uh, and your growing importance to the state and certainly this community. For a little background while you uh, get your wind from coming down from the North Country this evening, uh, I'd just like to go over the, the background uh, information for next tower. Okay. And then there's a course of action outlined uh, through prior meetings and feedback from Cordell Johnson. Um, Title III, Chapter 41, the choice and duties of town offers selectmen 41A, and certainly this next terror issue um, uh, is spoken to by this, is that the selectmen shall manage the prudential affairs of the town and perform the duties prescribed by law. And certainly with this multi-million dollar issue with next terror, the pollution control exemption is prudential. Uh, next terror Energy uh, owns and operates with subsidiaries a water, uh, Westinghouse pressurized water nuclear reactor with 193 fuel assemblies. Uh, it is a 40 foot high, 15 foot wide reactor vessel. It was designed, the site for two, they uh, built one. It's a double dome concrete and steel construction. It's 15 inches thick on the inner dome, four, four and a half feet thick on the uh, outer dome. The outside <coughs> height is 180 feet. Uh, the turbine generator is a GE product. There is a two, three mile long tunnels that carry water to and from the Atlantic Ocean. That water tunnel is the, the problem that we face here under 7712 small alpha, which is part of the taxation code for the state of New Hampshire. And that specifically is water and air pollution control facilities, and there's verbiage in that. Uh, inherently, I think the law is outdated. It's a, it's a, a poorly written law in the modern era. It yields uh, uh, development of uh, assessment, procedural uh, uh, pursuit to the state. State sets values, state sets conditions, state sets hearings, and uh, the poor town upon making this determination the state shall notify the applicant and the taxing authorities of the municipality where the facility is situate, situated whether the purpose of the facility is solely pollution control or not so it's out of our control um, this has been an ongoing problem we as a board I think the sediment would be uh, are not happy with the settlement that was executed we weren't uh, satisfied with that process uh, and it came down to the 11th hour and without getting into details that perhaps would um, betray confidentiality in legal procedure. Um, I, th I think the sentiment is not dissimilar from what Mr. Silberta came and said that he wasn't happy. And uh, I don't think the board is any more happy than he is. On August 18, 2014, uh, Mr. Tinker provided uh, the synopsis for the basis of the settlement uh, over from 
the last few years up to 2020, this settlement will cost us $2.18 million in lost revenue. Again, the state sets these values. Selectman Wolsey said it best, uh, if anybody here, this is an additional tax on the people of Hampton. Um, for the years 2011, 2012, and 2013, uh, $620,000 was refunded to Next Tower. That's out of Hampton taxpayers' pockets. <coughs> uh, the assessment, assessment uh, at $31 million has been mitigated. Going forward for the years 2015 through, through 2020, it will be another $1.56 million that we will not receive based on procedures by that law. Um, and again, as Selectman Woolsey so aptly states, an additional tax on the people of Hampton. Uh, Nextera Energy, the owner of this plant and its subsidiaries, uh, is a $15 billion corporation. Their third quarter net income was $660 million. Uh, it does operate a, uh, uh, a nuclear plant next to us. Uh, their ratepayers in Florida uh, have monthly electric bills well below the national average. Uh, I have studied that company uh, on a peripheral basis. They have thousands of employees, 14,000 employees. They're in Canada. They're led by a Harvard graduate, Mr. James L. Robo. Um, he's a successful man from Harvard on boards of directors, a former <coughs> GE Capital uh, executive that now uh, is the chairman and chief executive officer of this firm. Um, it's uh, an impressive company, and uh, they've taken money from Hampton taxpayers, but not just Hampton taxpayers. Additionally, from the state, millions of dollars from the state education fund, as Rennie Cushing would tell you, as uh, former Rep. Munns would tell you, who uh, proposed legislation last year, and as, as you know and you're working on. The <coughs> legislative review, um, from the Town and City, which is the New Hampshire Municipal Association, their finance and review, action policies that they support. Number eight, pollution control exemption. New Hampshire Municipal Association supports repeal of the so-called pollution and control exemption, RSA 7212, small alpha, or amendment of the statute to impose a term limitation on any exemption granted. February 19, 2013. Cordell Johnson, uh, the Legislative Affairs Director for the NHMA, wrote to the Honorable Marjorie Porter Chair, House Municipal and County Government Committee, uh, a, a great letter. It's a fabulous letter. The pollution control exemption originally enacted in 1955 before the existence of state and federal pollution laws was intended as an incentive for industrial facilities to make voluntary improvements to their plant and equipment to reduce air and water pollution. It has long since lost its usefulness as federal and state laws have made pollution control mandatory. Now, logically, the exemption is granted by the state. The municipality, the town of Hampton, has no control over this, as we just stated, and merely for installing pollution and control equipment that is required by law. Thus, under the statute, cities and towns must pay companies to comply with the state and federal law goes on in the letter, importantly, and we'll give you a little wind to get your, your uh, down south trip under your feet. The availability of this exemption does not depend in any way on the beneficiary's contribution to the state's economic development. All that matters is the presence of a pollution control device. The exemption is available only to a small class of taxpayers. It is useless to all other businesses, which end up bearing the cost of the exemption. Thus, its value in promoting any meaningful economic development is minimal. Further, if subsidizing economic, economic development is a state priority, it is the state's obligation to provide that subsidy. If the state wants to use the tax policy to foster economic development, whether through a pollution control exemption or otherwise, it should create an exemption or create a credit against the state tax, such as the business profits tax or business enterprise tax. Or it could allow the existing exemption to be taken only against the statewide property tax. We have no objection to letting municipalities in their discretion grant an exemption for pollution control or for economic development, nor do we object to any exemption or credit against state taxes. 
However, requiring local property taxpayers, Selectman Woolsey so emphatically states, to absorb this cost to advance the state policy is simply wrong. Again, he speaks to repeal of the law or that provision. In 2013, Cordell Johnson um, uh, has produced this data, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. All the selectmen have it. Uh, the uh, tax write-offs or tax dodge, to put it accurately, is now $4.2 million, and that's just local tax dollars. That has increased from 2004 from $2.8 million. So for the last 10 years, it's a 5% uh, tax break, 5% increase in your energy costs, if you will, for uh, the taxpayers in Hampton and other municipalities. Towns that are included in this are Bow, Claremont, Concord, Hampton, Hampton Falls, Hopkinton, Newington, Portsmouth, Seabrook, and Springfield to varying degrees. Some that suffer much more, some that suffer much less than we do. But certainly that uh, $2 million in change is painful for us to absorb uh, with our infrastructure needs. Uh, that data is from the MS-1. Uh, it's a very good head start, and that is for only utilities. That is not for non-utility uh, platforms that, that Cordell so adroitly and skillfully provided to us. Uh, 17 November, uh, Judy Silva, Barbara Reed, and Cordell were down here. Uh, subsequent to that um, meeting, Cordell has uh, tasked and, and put uh, together a, uh, a scheme of maneuver and courses of action. Nancy, you have this legislation to repeal RSA 7012. Representative Cushing is in there for legislative sponsorship. You are co-sponsors. It has taskings for the Hampton Board of Selectmen and the town manager to make liaison with other communities in need. There's deadlines coming up. Then there's actions by the New Hampshire Municipal Association. So having given it that background and where we want to go, and now is the legislative season. Senator, the floor is yours. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I guess that's what you'd like me to speak to then. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I did meet with uh, the Hampton reps last week, uh, and we have decided to re-up our meeting the first of every month again to work on things important to the state. Rennie has filed a bill. I think he told you the other day that he is looking to shift the prime sponsorship to um, someone in the majority party uh, in outside of outside of Hampton that would uh, be able to carry it forward and then all of the Hampton would be signed on to that. <clears throat> I think he has identified the person. I don't know if he has accepted that or not. I did sign off on that last week. I sent my uh, via email to be signed off on it, so that should be fine. Um, I think the others have also signed off on it. I know that there is a plan for us to work together to ready f uh, for the hearing, but I think also part of the thing that Cordell put together was for you to be in contact with your um, peers in, in other communities <coughs> to do the same thing. So um, probably what we'll do is um, <laughs> probably get together prior to that hearing date, whenever it happens to be. <clears throat> the, the bills probably won't come out until middle of January, is what they're expecting is the earliest <clears throat> for the bills to come out. Now, whether that will be on the top of the deck, it's 0001, so um, <laughs> uh, whether it will actually get that final number or not, I don't know. They usually reserve House Bill 1 and House Bill 2 for uh, appropriations. So I don't know exactly what the number will be, but we will be working together as a team to see if we can't um, move it along a little bit further. And also to identify the um, representatives, uh, especially where it starts in the house, uh, to also get in there to speak to it from those other communities that you have identified mm -hmm. there on the sheet. So uh, that would be the plan. Uh, as far as I know, I know he has two uh, LSRs in. I have only seen the one that is full repeal. That's the only one that has come to me. Um, the other one, I, I, was, I thought it was going to... Um, just a point of order, Senator. So, uh, could you explain for the audience an LSR? I'm sorry. It's a legislative uh, service request. Request. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just stop and think of the R. <clears throat> so that will become a piece of legislation as soon as it's been signed off by everyone and given a number, then it will go to the floor in the House for a hearing, go to the floor of the House for a vote, um, 
come over to the Senate for hearing and the Senate for a vote as long as we can get it out of the committee. Now, you know, last time we had difficulty getting it out of the committee. Um, I think the committee has changed. I don't know who is going to be the chair of that committee yet. Um, I spoke with the uh, new speaker yesterday, yesterday, uh, and he <clears throat> expects to have his uh, chairman's all appointed before the end of the week, and probably the committee people too. So we'll have a better sense of who sits where and what kind of people we would really like to have on that piece of legislation and need to bring to the table to discuss it. So, Thank you. Selectman Wilson. Uh, this is a burden on the state as well as on the communities, as the chairman has pointed out. So I would think the state would have a dog in the hunt on this one, that someone in Concord, hopefully, would say we want to level the playing field for everybody. Yeah, I mean, you're you're losing revenue too. It's an intolerable situation. This is a dreadful thing to foist on the taxpayers. It really is. Well, I would I would hope so because, as you know, the state can use whatever revenue that it should have been generating. <laughs> Thank you for doing all that you can. Um, I know it's not easy, and you've been at this for some time. And um, if, you know, please keep us informed. I have also filed the um, meals and rooms tax bill as well. That's been filed. So we'll do. We'll work together the same way on that piece of legislation and try to um, elicit <coughs> others that are in that same situation. Fortunately, one of the people, uh, one of the sponsors from last year, happens to be the um, minority leader in the Senate. So I have him attached to the bill. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he'll sign off on it. Both sides. <laughs> Pardon me? Both sides. Yeah, both yeah. sides. <laughs> Second trial. No, I think uh, I think uh, Senator Stiles is, uh, has always had our best interest at heart. I think uh, it's never easy to push a bill through Concord. Uh, I always used to say it's like herding cats up there. <laughs> uh, and it, sometimes it can be that way. But uh, I, I think if we can work together with the other towns that are listed, I think that will certainly help her cause, and uh, hopefully we'll see some relief in this this year. Well, I think, as I have said to uh, other selectmen when they have come to Concord, um, the committee usually hears the selectmen when they speak. I mean, they hear us, but we're also there every day. We have to work constantly and behind the scenes to herd in the cats, as Rusty would say, to try to get the bills moved. But if a selectman appears before a board um, or, or a town manager appears before a board, uh, it carries a fair amount of weight. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want, if you can partner with some of your other peers out there, uh, I think that would be a benefit. I think I heard Cordell say when he was here that there were only two of them speaking uh, on the last bill, so it was tough. But mm -hmm. So you just need to bring in the troops and uh, yep. get them to Got speak. It. Thank you, sir. And I will ask you to come twice because I will have a launch of the meals and rooms staff. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, has any other of the, the town's representatives or senators, have, have any of them approached you on, on this problem? No. No, they haven't. No, that, that always interested me when I was up there no. and stuff, that a lot of times people wouldn't, when we went through the spiking thing. Mm -hmm. That Portsmouth and us were the only two working on it, and the others just seemed to let it drop. Yeah. So, so sometimes when we say, you know, it, it, this is a big issue, sometimes people just let it go. And I think the important thing is, as you know, and Rennie knows, and Fred probably who's on this also, right, is to get something passed. Right. And and some people view it as an increased tax if we do it, as where the town's looking at it as that we need the the break from it. So it's it's going to be a difficult issue. I, it will be now. The second piece of legislation that Rennie filed, um, I just glanced at the title quickly, and it didn't, I thought it was going to be one that would remove it after the 25 years, which is what he did last year, but this one I think is a little bit different, and I'm and not exactly sure how that's going to yeah. be processed. It's really going to be important for us mm -hmm. to do our work, because, you know, they're filing the legislation and they're going to work on it up there. But if we can't get the other towns that are involved and the other selectmen to get up there with us so that you're en masse talking about it, mm -hmm. it it's not going to go anyplace. Absolutely. You know, and we got to, and we got to, 
<clears throat> because as Rennie said when we talked with him, he said there were so many groups against this, higher education was against it, because uh, some Franklin, Franklin Pierce, Pierce could lose. Yeah. Uh, you know, so people, people who are getting the break are going to fight us. <laughs> So it, it, it's important that, 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 mm -hmm. we, that the Cordell came up with that plan and that we follow through with the plan and we don't leave our legislators and our senator out there and say, <laughs> all right, you guys got the ball now. If you don't bring it back, we're going to be angry. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to do our work, and yeah. I, I think right. that's important. So thanks for what you do. Sure. Oh, I mm -hmm. thought you were working. Um, Selectman Waddell went to Concord specifically to address this with uh, the NHMA, and uh, it's so great having two, uh, all, all the board members, but spe spe specifically having two former legislators yeah. is, is, is key because they know how it goes. And speaking specifically to uh, the former representative's remarks, um, there has been the filing of the legislation, or that's imminent. And then it talks about Hampton Board of Selectmen. Uh, to constant contact the municipalities, I think, and this is my feeling, perhaps the board agrees, that um, Mr. Welch, in his imminent stature, could uh, discuss with not only Newington, Portsmouth, and Seabrook, but Bow, Claremont, Concord, all of those municipalities, that Fred has the, the point on that. Mm -hmm. He contacts them. It, if we have eight towns, we could be talking 60 people, and that's as Rusty says, for yeah. cats. So if we could task you, if there's a consensus there to that. There are more than eight. For the, for the town, yeah. um, speci and, and our interest, that because it's a utility issue, is, is that utility, perhaps. Um, if you could, you could join that fight yeah. commencing tomorrow morning um, and then secure that co-sponsorship. And then if you could coordinate with both Nancy mm -hmm. and Cordell yeah. uh, going forward for the New Hampshire Municipal Association, yeah. because this is imminent and this is here now. We, we have December 15, January. So if you could commence that in accordance with a very short period of time. Wonderful. And, and the fact that um, the association has that as one of their <coughs> primary uh, positions, um, that, some, that carries weight in a committee as well. It does. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Yes, sir. And I think we should keep in mind also that with the rooms and meals tax, the same thing. We've got to make a coordinated effort to help mm -hmm. get that passed mm -hmm. from the towns that are going to. The toughest thing is to identify the communities. That's the toughest yeah. piece. But. Yeah. I mean, we, we know a lot of them yeah. already. I mean, that's uh, pretty easy to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so right. I, I do have a list of about 58 I think, that would stack up. So if we could, if we could um, go ahead and we thank you, Senator, for your, your, your trip. Yes, we have, I want to, and I'll come right back to you, Mary Louise. And then Fred is going to grab tip of the spear <coughs> on that. And we can absolutely mirror this effort and this coordinating effort with both the NHMA and Fred and, and for the rooms and meals and, and just duplicate that. So, what yes, is the list of 58? I have a, I have a list of uh, ones that. Uh, the 58 that have uh, more than 30 uh, facilities that contribute. Okay. <laughs> and just before we go to Mary Louise Senator. Give me that. I'll be happy to um, <laughs> sort of reach out to my compatriots. <laughs> Could you just explain for the audience um, the, the, the uh, intent of that Rooms and Meals uh, the, uh, legislation? Intent, okay. <clears throat> right now, the, um, all of our restaurants and hotels pay a 9% nine, nine tax. It's a, it's a pass-through. They collect it from the... Um, um, the Patrons. customers, customers, thank you, <laughs> and just pass it on to the state. They take a small piece out, and when it gets to the state, it's supposed to be broken into a 60-40 um, split. So 60 stays with the state, and 40 goes back to communities, and it's based on the population in the community. So in Hampton, for example, we have 100, 120 pe uh, um, people in this community during the summer, but during the rest of the year, we have less than 15,000. So we get reimbursed based on the 14,000, whatever the latest population is, 900 and something. <clears throat> and so don't the other communities. We have other communities that really maybe have one or two businesses in them, but they may have a large population. So they get back based on their population, even though their community hasn't really contributed. The biggest pushback that I've been getting on that whole piece is, um, well, Nancy, it's just like the um, education funding. You know, you don't want to pay more for the education funding and, and uh, give it to the other people. So it's the same thing. Why should you get any more of the meals and rooms taxed back? And I said, we generate the money for the state. 
they do all the work. It costs our local tax. It costs our local taxpayers extra police, extra fire, extra public works, and that comes out of local tax dollars. So we should be getting some of that back. So I've asked for a portion of that 40 percent to be sent back to the communities that generate the money. That's what I've done. We'll see how that goes. Um, I put in the bill uh, as such. I, I debated whether to put it in as a study committee or whether to put it in as uh, a regular bill. I decided to put it in as a regular bill. And if I get a lot of pushback, I'm going to ask for a study committee to come out of it. At least it would have to have a year's worth of study before uh, any action. But I don't want to lose it. And the two individuals that you referred to on that particular committee, the Ways and Means Committee in, in the Senate, uh, did not return to the Senate this year. So um, I've been looking at who is on that. As a matter of fact, I was riding with one touring the North Country today and was filling him in on how important it would be to listen to the situations going down in the seacoast. And I told him that I would return the favor of touring the North Country, that I would bring everybody down here and tour the seacoast when, when the sun comes out. Wonderful. Thank you. Selectman Wilson, you've had yes, something. Yes, as long as you're kind enough to be here, and I really appreciate having you here this evening. I think from point of view of local taxpayers, we have some serious concerns about where the state is going. Um, the state still owes us $1.8 million of SRF funding. Now, those funds are supposed to be given over to the towns after the projects are completed. As far as I understand, I think we're still lagging way behind and being reimbursed on the SRF funding. Retirement is another big, big problem. And you probably, I'm sure you're looking at the local news, the situation in Northampton uh, with the police department. And uh, as you are uh, rightly communicating to other individuals, uh, if you're using the census to try to figure out what kind of little dribbles to give to a community, that's outrageous. Uh, given the population of the town. Last year, uh, Chairman Bean asked the departments to get together a recap on what we actually spend as a community in the summer. We have such a huge population. We've had huge growth. <coughs> we need more police officers. We need more firefighters. The increase in population has really caused a strain on our community. We can't afford it. It would cost us a fortune to put on the extra police and firefighters that we need, given the shortfall in the retirement system and not being paid back. Those beach-related costs are huge, and they're getting bigger every year. And we are sitting here, and we're basically crippled on providing local services because we can't get the recognition. The census is irrelevant. The census, if the census only included those of us sitting at the table, it's, it's property owners. Mm -hmm. It's business owners. That's right. It's the entire community as a community. Mm -hmm. And we have provided more than, I think, more than over and above services and accommodations to the state of New Hampshire. And I, as, as one representative of, of the public, am tired of being at the bottom of the barrel. I'm fed up with not getting some t type of compensation from the state of New Hampshire for the services that we provide. And that retirement system has got to be looked at. And it's unconscionable, Nancy, not to get, have the state do its share. That's terrible. Well, I, I don't think you're going to see the, sh the state pick, pick up that share again. Um, mm. Sorry, I, that's the news that I have to deliver. But um, I do have another bill in this year that, uh, if you remember, last year I was working with former Senator Preston mm -hmm. on an affinity car bill. We sent that out to the local banks, and there wasn't a huge interest in picking that up. But there was an interest in uh, working with the state on their P card, their purchase cards. And so I have introduced uh, legislation, enabling legislation, not mandatory. So those communities that choose to do so could participate in the, in the state um, um, purchase card program. What that will do, and my first question was, how do my communities get in, and how do they get out? <laughs> the old parts of the <laughs> And yes. it would be done basically on a two- to a three-year uh, agreement, so that if, if you tried it, and two years later you decided you didn't like it, you, didn't, you wouldn't have to continue it. That's what I'm told so far. So um, what they gave me for an example was um, 
if a community spent like three million dollars on incidentals, your salt, anything that you bought, furniture, anything. I mean, there's a list about this long. Um, then when the state put that out to bid, they would know collectively how much was going to be purchased and everybody would get a better price because they'd know from the beginning how much it was going to be. Then you would get your uh, return on your, on your sales like you normally do now from however you do your, your financing now. But they would all, because of the volume, there would be an extra amount. So the example of $3 million, you'd get back your normal $35,000 to $40,000, plus you would also get an additional 9000 something. Actually, it would be like, it's almost 20000 and that 20000 would be split. You would get yours back. The other would go to the state, and the money that's going to the state is going to be split 50-50, half into the unfunded liability, half into the rainy day fund to try to uh, keep our rates low, but also to try to get that unfunded liability paid off. Mm. It's $5 billion. We're short $5 billion in the, in the retirement system. Thank you. Feet. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate okay. it very much. You're yes. welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I apologize for my attire, but <laughs> it was Look cold. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Looks you. very New Hampshire-y. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Back to old business, Romans 6. <laughs> Selectman Wilsey, did you have any further old business? Well, are we going to go over the articles, as uh, Mr. Waddell said? Are we going over the... Uh, Articles that we've been given here. The, what is the, well, the, the, the board's board's board. the energy and safety improvements to the town offices. I mean, I assume we were given this for some purpose. Improvements to Exeter Road. We've we've voted on on warrants. Are there, are there any are there any warrants that? Um, I just I wanted to bring up if I could. Yes, sir. Article thirty four. We voted on that. That one I think we to go with that. That's the one for the the uh, capital reserve funds for the banking. Yes. Uh, for the trustees of the trust. Mm -hmm. And I went to their meeting today, the trustees of the oh, trust, good. and I think if Arthur looks at their minutes, it'll, it'll answer all the questions that he had tonight because they discussed those issues that, that he was bringing up specifically tonight. But they also at, at recommend, you know, wanted to make sure that, that this was recommended by the board. If the board, if that was the favor, and I guess we did put the recommendation on the Warren article we're going to because they said people might not understand. You haven't voted to recommend any Warren articles as of yet. Okay. All right. So, but, but they, they, they were requesting <coughs> that if we could, that it could be one recommended by the board so that, uh, okay. because they, they, they're worried that people would not understand it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's simply to clarify the problem that they've been having, right, Fred? That's correct. To, to correct a problem. Yeah. So I'm just bringing that up so that we talk about it. Well, that's 34, Jim? Article I think it's 34. Yeah. Okay. It's 34. Yeah. We do usually do that at a specific time, don't we? We do. And, and it's usually after the warrant closes and uh, petition articles are in so that you can look at them in the total substance of the actual warrant. Right. And so we, oh, we won't be reviewing in detail or, or going over that. We'll, we'll have that for some to-be-determined date. But th thank you for attending that meeting today. Okay. Yeah, I well. appreciate good. it. That's Sele not on. Selectman Griffin, more um, under old business, if any. Um, you know, I just would like to say, from what we were just talking about, I would like to have, uh, to see Hampton get a better share of the rooms and profit tax. But, you know, I think that, you know, some of the statements Mrs. Wolseley just made about um, the growth and blah, 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 well, there's, a, there's going to be a lot more tax revenue coming in in the future. And uh, I don't think that, um, <clears throat> I don't know, I just, it, it sounds to me like it's so negative about what's happening down there when, in fact, so many positive things are happening there. It's not a negative. Uh, I think that the real estate is going quite well down there. And it's going to be in give us increased money to work with in the future when we do need to have something. But I don't really see a sense of dire uh, problems down there as a result of what's happening in Hampton. I think it's nothing but positive. And I just would like to throw that out there. 
Thank you, sir. No, I don't have anything right now. Thank you. I'm set. I'm Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm sorry about that, but too bad. We're going to sit here and, and I, I don't oh, just just a point of order. I, I don't understand was uh, I I'm sorry about that and uh, it's too bad. I don't know what that means. Uh, if we can stick to something specific, I was, I was, the floor is yours, yeah, lady. I, at least a the small floor is discussion. Yours. Okay. Uh, I don't know if anybody listened to Chief Sawyer before the Budget Committee or the Deputy Fire Chief and the problems that the Police Department cannot work on because they are understaffed because we keep losing special officers and regular police officers to other communities where the pay is better. And in time, some of the new developments will bring in more taxes, and we hope we see a positive result of that uh, coming in for the, with the reval next year. But on the other hand, a question I had for our representative to the planning board that I would like him to carry back is, where are the impact fees for the municipality? Where are the impact fees being assessed against developers that the planning board has had the authority to assess since 2002? And they're assessing $3,000 per house for the school fee. Where are the municipal impact fees? I talked to one member of the planning board last year, whom I will not name, and I said, how come <coughs> you're not assessing the impact fees for the municipality? We've lost the ability to tax for the construction of a police station, two fire stations, and the Church Street pump station. We can't go back on those because they're already <coughs> constructed. I even challenged the planning board last year to put a warrant article on asking the public to take away their authority since they're not going to use it. <coughs> and I mentioned it to one member of the planning board last year, and I said, you really got to, f to settle down and start assessing impact fees. Once the development is built, that will roll into taxes, and that's what you're talking about. But, but building, we're bringing in more traffic, we're bringing in more people, we're bringing in higher buildings, we're bringing in more and more of a strain on the police and fire departments. And I said to the gentleman, you know, when are you going to use your authority to do impact fees? And he said, I'll never do it. I think that's a rather unfortunate response from an elected official. Okay, well, we just need, a, just just a, so if, a, a, if no, Griffin no, I'm going to I'm going to grab, grab I'm going to grab the floor here for a second. If Mr. And can I'm going to select my Let me grab the floor. It, uh, yes. I, I, in this well, board, this board, this board is not going to be <coughs> criticizing other elected officials or board members and 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 condemning their statements. It's it's not appropriate. Uh, it's not what this town's about, and, and we're not going to continue that. Not on this board. It, it's not going to. It's not going to pass muster here. So if we can refrain from doing that, these are elected boards in their own province. They have. They're very powerful. They're very dedicated. It's a lot of time. That planning board is a tough board. It's a lot of work. It's in in many ways, and at the very essence, much more difficult than this work. And uh, we're not here to criticize others. Is there any other old business this evening? Where's the revenue? Seen, seen none. Uh, <coughs> Close, Mr. Welch. You want to hear my report? For that? Uh, you, you know, you didn't have it on the agenda. Yeah, I know. Because and you told me you didn't have it on the agenda. Yeah. 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 Well, welcome back, and please, we'd love to hear it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, the perambulation of the town line between Seabrook and Hampton is due for walking in 2015. Excellent. And I would like to know how the board would like to proceed in completing that statutory requirement. I'll be there. Um, <laughs> Well, you, well, you have, it's you have a, a long new hip walk. now, right? It's a long one. <laughs> you have a new hip now, right? Yes, I do. Yes, I did it last time, even with a bad hip. So, uh, the board will remember uh, this concern over the seal die off that, that uh, we experienced two years ago. We have received word through Ellen Gothel that a report has been concluded that the seals do contain avian, avian inf influenza, and contact with humans should be avoided at all times. Individuals and animals should not be in contact with dead seals at any time. Oh. Our public works people and the people who specialize in taking care of the dead seals and marking them and so on and so forth are handling them properly. So it's not a problem. But <coughs> people, if they see them on the beach, should not touch them yeah. and shouldn't allow their dogs or other animals to touch them. Um, the board will be meeting next Monday with individuals involved in the Sea Level Rise Commission to discuss town participation and study efforts. The Council for the Town and the Beach Precinct are working to close the deeds for the transfer of properties for the Beach Fire Station. Yeah, we anticipate the deed transfer will occur before the end of this year, and hopefully that, that's the way it will be. Uh, just for general information, the Board of Selectmen has on their schedule that they will not be meeting 
on the meeting of uh, December 29th, which is the last Monday of the year. Why? Uh, because that's what you put on there. Uh, uh, you, voted, you voted to change the schedule, and uh, that's one of the things that the board voted to put on. So uh, it's on, unless you change it. Um, I have the signature sheet for the change in the um, purchasing policy, which you voted at the last meeting. Mm -hmm. And with the chairman's permit, permit, permission, uh, since you've already voted it, I would like to pass it around for signature. Sure. I'll start that around. Uh, we do have a request that came <coughs> in today from um, Congressman-elect Frank Ginta, who would like to request permission to hold a town hall meeting in the Selectman's meeting room, this room, on Thursday, December 18th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is to give residents of the town of Hampton an opportunity to voice their concerns and opinions with their next representative of Congress. The meeting will be open to Hampton residents, and we expect the local media coverage of the event. Um, I also have a um, email from Betty Moore uh, regarding the 375th banners that were across the, the streets. Um, the museum has one of them, and the other two are available for pickup. Um, they were taken down the experience ha as the experience Hampton banners were put up. <coughs> uh, what would the board like to do with those two banners? Uh, do you want to sell them? Do you want to store them? Do you want to uh, do something else with them? Um, so that's that's a request for a thought process, and and let us know what you want. And if it's necessary, we'll put something on the agenda for signature so that you can uh, you can vote and do what you'd like. I also have a request here uh, for a live nativity uh, parade and public gathering license for the Hampton United Methodist Church. On Lafayette Road, they are going to uh, do a live nativity. Uh, it's going to be next to the state highway, and uh, the statute <coughs> requires that they get a a parade and public gathering license because it's next to the highway. So, if the board has no objections, uh, you need to vote that, and, and I'll pass it around for signature if you do. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions for the town manager? Uh, would you repeat the co Congressman Ginta's um, whatever? Date. Um, he is going to be here. He would like to be here for Thursday, December 18th, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. in this room. Okay. Thank you. And the board would need to approve that under your existing policy. Without objection? Seeing none? Approved? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Welch? Well, I, what are we supposed to do with the parade here? Because I don't quite understand the context of it. The parade? Well, or whatever the you say. Oh, the public yeah. gathering license. Public gathering. Yeah. The law requires if you hold a public gathering of more than 50 people, and it's so, on, on a lot next to <coughs> a public road, oh, okay. a public gathering so license. So where, where is the gathering? It's going to be at the Methodist Church on Lafayette Road. Oh, okay. Since the lot is next to a town, is next to yeah. a highway control yeah. of the town, they need a permit. No, they have a fairly large lot in the back. I'm assuming. They do. Most of it will be yeah, okay. It'll be out of sight. Okay. It'll be out of the way. I just wanted to understand what yeah. we're doing. Okay, I'll so move that we accept that. Second. If All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Selectman Griffin for the town manager. No. Selectman Thank Brody. you. Thank you, sir. Nope. Thank you, sir. Mr. Waddell. Nope. Thank you, sir. Uh, just going forward to, in, in terms of uh, wrapping up for closing comments, uh, it, it is December. Uh, we had a, a great summer here. I echo the board's uh, enthusiasm and specifically uh, Selectman Griffin's that things are going very well, both at the beach and in town. And wanted to talk about some of the prudential uh, accomplishments and phenomena this year. And, and starting with this, this board coming in, uh, this newly elected board, it was great to post uh, a former legislator, Mr. Waddell, a retired teacher, a retired fire captain, Mr. Bridal, a uh, great public servant, also a former legislator, and uh, a perennial selectman and former chair, Mr. Griffin, and a, and a seasoned business owner um, in Hampton. Uh, in terms of uh, furthering prudential affairs of the town, uh, the command element was uh, reinforced. Mr. Welch uh, received a unanimous, uh, unanimously enthusiastic three-year contract to uh, lead uh, the town departments. Uh, Jamie Sullivan, uh, the former police chief, uh, transitioned to the personnel and human resources assistant town manager uh, job. And that was seamless, that was unforeseen, and again, a unanimous decision by the board. 
Uh, the tax department was reinforced. They handle in excess of a million dollars a week and all of the other exigencies and contingencies that go with that department and again reinforce the headquarters element. Mike Swartzer retired. Again, promoting from within, Director Pulliam, uh, a, a fantastically experienced, detailed, accomplished uh, finance director. What a, a tremendous job she's doing as we support this warrant season and this, this budget season. And it, it seems like that never ends. And she has stepped right in and done a fabulous job. The Hampton Police Department leadership has transitioned down there. And the men and women that, that served there are committed to the new leadership. And what a fabulous department that has been. The annual audit by Plotznik and Anderson was addressed, and Gatsby funding and, and bringing us in a line for depreciation to bring us into a, a modern business era, that was executed. Mr. Welch worked with um, the, the budget constraints, and we did that out of Hyde, uh, no new expenses. Um, we identified the uncompensated absence liability on that audit. There's a million dollar hole still in our budget uh, for people that are due money if they suddenly retire or leave our service. So there's work to be done on that. Specifically uh, with Mr. Waddell and, and, and Rusty and the board, our engagement with the New Hampshire Municipal Association. Um, there's tremendous legal services, tremendous governmental affairs capability, and we are seeing those synergies. And I think that is going to work very well with Jim <coughs> Silva, Cordell Johnson, and Barbara Reed. I thought their brief here on the 17th was outstanding. Uh, they briefed uh, balance sheet and income statement challenges to include uh, the pension liabilities that yep. Mary Louise talked yeah. about and the health insurance. Senator Stiles grows more important every election, uh, in, 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 as we see today, was in the North Country. And what a tremendous asset. And we thank her for coming down this evening. We have moved through the budget process. Our, our votes were, were cohesive. We're enthusiastic about our operating budget for this year and the Warren article process as well. We're talking about funding a pumper truck, first phase of the Exeter Road, and all the, the, the cats and dogs that go along with those. But again, uh, close to $10 million or approaching $10 million was brought in, and we're far less than that in what this board uh, weeded through. Uh, again, the fire pump, uh, that has been addressed. Uh, we're in underway with our union, union negotiations with both fire unions, and I think those are fruitful. I think they're collegial, and I think they're going to they're um, be conducted very nicely. We've established the Health Insurance Committee per the contract of, of several years ago that was never done, and we have a joint and cohesive un, uh, effort with the unions on that. So we're working those issues. Good news, and we, we talk about the trust funds, the trust fund and the unassigned fund balance are over $20 million in this town, and that's not hay. That's good money, and that's solid government, and that's solid leadership. So in terms of our operation, our employees, our taxpayers, our shareholders, and our residents, uh, this really is a world-class community. And I would invite anybody that runs a government, whether it's a state capital uh, or a world capital, to come to Hampton and see how people here do it. And I think it's very, very positive. And it's uh, very exemplary, and I think it is of the highest standard. So thank you to the board members. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Uh, any, any adjournment motion? Before we move to adjourn, yeah. I still don't remember m a motion that we not meet the last <coughs> Monday in December. I know we did every other week. Would you like to December? make a motion to meet on the 29th of December? I will so move. Is there a second? See God your motion us. fails. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. Motion adjourned. Waddell, Bridal, all those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, Do you have a black pen? Yes, I do.